Welcome to Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. This is where we answer your Bible questions. Temptation is not sin. It's when we yield ourselves to that thing. That's when it becomes sin. I believe what this is, and I'm going to trust you. So what prophecies were they studying that helped them know when the Messiah would come? That's a good question. And I think we've got a pretty good answer for you here. Welcome to Line Up Online, brought to you by It Is Written. This is where we get to answer your Bible questions. I'm John Bradshaw. With me, Pastor Wes Peppers. Wes, ready to go? Ready to go. Good to be here. Great to have you here. Let's start at the beginning. What's our first question? All right. Our first question comes from Julie, and she says, Will you please explain Deuteronomy 14.26? It sounds like God is saying you can drink wine, but elsewhere in the Bible, he counsels against it. What does the Bible say? Now let's take a look at the verse. I'll read from the King James. Thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, whatever you desire, for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. Well, it sounds like God is saying, you got money, you can go to the liquor store and buy down there at that liquor store whatever you'd like. But would that be consistent with the rest of the Bible? It is not. There's many places in the Bible that say, You shall not drink the alcohol. Stay away from it. It's not for God's people. So the Bible doesn't conflict. It's consistent all the way through. I've got a question for you. And and, and Julie, don't take this personally. Um, Why in the world would anybody, I'm not saying you do, you're asking a genuine question as question. But why in the world would anybody want to drink alcohol? A fair question. That's a pretty good question. No, we understand people. You know, if you have a past and you've been there, you you can you can ask this question with some compassion, some understanding. Alcohol is profoundly bad for you. Alcohol is cancer causing. We talk about the damage that cigarettes do. Alcohol is carcinogenic. It causes cancer. Alcohol causes domestic violence and all sorts of crime and the loss of dignity and the loss of. Um, respect and all sorts of things. It's implicated in all kind of crime. It's ruined families again and again and again. I understand, you know, when you're fun, it's edgy, when you're young, it's edgy and it's fun to get a little, yeah. to get a little uh, out of control. Mm-hmm. How can that be fun? You know, we understand people think it's fun, but it isn't and it's dangerous and it's silly. And when it comes to reducing your alcohol intake, people say, well, I've cut back. The experts will say, and I, I hate to say this, If you Google it, you'll see it because the experts are saying it everywhere now. The only safe level to which you can reduce your alcohol consumption is to zero. Zero. That's the only safe reduction. So why do you think God said this? What we do know is that God frequently meets people where they are. God permitted slavery. That doesn't mean it was God's idea. uh, But he permitted it because that's where the people were and he worked with them. He permitted slavery. Polygamy. No, polygamy is not biblical. It's not the will of God. It's not appropriate. But that's where they were back then. So God was kind of working with them. There are times in the Bible that you can see God was working with his people. Noah got blind drunk Lot, tragically drunk, and all kinds of terrible things happened there. Uh, Doesn't mean God uh, okayed that or was in agreement with that but he worked with his faulty people just like he works with you and me. Any other thoughts? Yeah, in addition to that, in the context of this passage, they are going up to Jerusalem. So they're making a journey up to Jerusalem to have sacrifices. And God tells them to take the the goods that they had, whether it be the juice, the fresh grape juice off the vine, or the, um, the crops or whatever, take them up there and then sell them and give that money as an offering. Well, by the time they made that journey, that grape juice would already be fermenting. And in fact, in other places, it talks about them taking that wine or that juice and pouring it out on the ground as a drink offering. So God is not commanding them to drink it. Correct. He's commanding them to use it as an offering. So, you know, it's, it's a very vague text to try to take and say, oh, yeah, God's telling us we can drink alcohol. Yes, very I, vague. I think you make a good point there. Some texts are real clear. Mm-hmm. Others you look at, you go, hmm, yeah. we've really got to dig here to try to find out what God was on about. So when he says that in Deuteronomy 14, 26, and over in the Proverbs and numerous other places, he speaks categorically in opposition to alcohol. When I was a brand new Christian, I had an interesting thing happen. A pastor gave me a list of Bible texts 
Now, I was uh, a long way from home. I remember the texts were put together by a pastor, I think from Alabama. Didn't matter. It was something, it was a resource. It was before the internet. Uh So he didn't print it off, somebody found online. And there were like 160 texts or something referencing alcohol in the negative. Yes. In the negative. So I don't think it's sophistication that says, I'd like to drink alcohol. I don't think it's progressivism that says, I'd like to drink alcohol. It's selfishness. That's right. And, That's and, right. and while I'm busy offending you, let me go a little bit further. It's ignorance. You think, oh, well, I'll drink a little of this and I'll look as cool as my neighbors and I can buy this wine and, and, and talk about where it was grown and what the vintage was. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you or your children or someone is going to do what you do and will lose their dignity, right. maybe their life, maybe their health, certainly a bunch of money. It's not smart. Leave it alone. Just real quick, uh, what you said earlier about, um, you know, science now is saying that the acceptable level is zero. Zero. It used to be that science said, oh, one drink a day is good correct, for you. Correct, correct. And now they've reneged that. So now science does not even say that you should do that or, or it's good for you. You remember they used to say, oh, well, uh, uh, drink red grape juice. It's yes. good, good for you. Red wine yes. is good for your heart. Red wine. It's not true. That's right. And grape any, juice and is any, good for anything you. Anything, the resveratrol that's in the red grapes, oh, that's that's mm-hmm. evidently good for you. But but they say the good effects have been way overblown. Yeah. Probably because yeah. a study was done by a winemaker. That's right. Uh, but but the, the, the literature or the propaganda that says it's good for you is simply not true. Now... People do it all the time. They, they say, I know something's not good for me. I'm going to do it anyway. That's for you to figure out between you and God. Mm-hmm. We would suggest you don't. But I could take a glass of orange juice with some cobra venom in it and say, I'm going to drink this because orange juice is good for me, but it's going to have other problems. You don't want to add bad to what is good. You want to just take that which is good, and that's what God gives us. Alcohol is cobra venom. That's right. No, that's true. That's it. It's bad stuff. Okay, I've got a question for you from Rebecca. Who does the Bible identify as the false prophet? That's a great question. It's a prophetic question, and you find that in the book of Revelation chapter 13. And it talks about, in uh, chapter 16, the false prophet. But we're going to take a look at Revelation chapter 13 because it really more detailedly uh, describes that. In Revelation chapter 13, you have two beasts. You have the beast that rises up out of the sea, and then you have the beast that rises up out of the earth. Okay, what is this, Jurassic Park? What is a beast? Yeah, well, Daniel chapter 7 and other places talk about a beast in prophecy being a nation or a kingdom or some kind of entity uh, related to that, political okay, okay, or religious. Okay, so folks who look at prophecy down the end of time and say the beast is going to be a man That's simply right. cannot be it true. It just cannot be. You know, no disrespect intended, but it cannot be true because we've got that, as you said, in Daniel and other places. Yeah. Beast is a kingdom or a nation. There are novels that say that the Antichrist power is a man. You know, he has red eyes and all these different things, but the Bible doesn't indicate that at all. The yeah. Bible does say that this beast power is led by a man, mm. but it is not specifically a man. It's a power. It's a, it's a religious we power. Know the Bible is novel, but it's not a novel. That's right. Yeah. So the first beast rises from the sea. We get through the characteristics given in Revelation 13 that that is the Antichrist power at the end of time. The second beast aids that first beast to enforce false worship upon the world. And uh, this is the, the, the major end time scenario at the end of time. We see from the reformers, many reformers throughout time identify that first beast as the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, that is... Well, the papacy, really. The, the papacy, yeah. that's right. Now, you, you, you mentioned many reformers, so let's name some Martin Luther. Martin Luther. His psychic Melanchthon. Mm-hmm. Huss. Mm-hmm. His assistant or, or, or collaborator, Jerome, yep. uh, John Calvin, mm-hmm. uh, John Knox, John Wesley, John Wesley, that's far more Charles recent. Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, who was after the Reformation, but that's preached right. that Reformation that's, theology. Yeah. So the point is, the statement that you just made was believed by Protestantism. Mm-hmm. 100% of Protestants believed that so for many studied, hundreds of years hundreds of years yes. so it didn't come out of a vacuum and, and and how we got away from that is a study in and of itself mm-hmm. but back to you go ahead sure and so that's consistent throughout christian theology until just very recently and so the second beast power that you find when you look at those identifying points and you can go to it is and find full programs that describe all those 
but it seems to indicate the United States of America is that second beast power. Mm -hmm. So those two working together at the end of time will be seeking to enforce the mark of the beast upon the world. And I would say they would act in sincerity. Yes. They would be, they would do what they think is for the greater good. Mm -hmm. But what we have, particularly with the, the mother church, is a system that appeals first to tradition and second to the Bible. First to uh, custom and second to the Bible. So whenever you have that, whenever you have that, you've got something that's simply not being faithful to Scripture. So you can, in your heart of heart, say, but I believe in what the magisterium have said. I believe in what the edicts of popes down through the years. And if that's what you genuinely believed, God bless you. That's your right um, as a human being. But if you were to say, you know what I really want to do is put the Bible first. We think that would be the more biblical way to go. Christians are people who follow Christ. Christ is revealed to us in his word. Okay, we go to, to the third question. What have we got? All right, the next question is, what does the Bible say about drinking alcohol? Oh, well, there we go. We kind of covered that, didn't we? We did. Why don't we read some of those mm -hmm. uh, passages? I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 20. If you've got another one, you might want to find that. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 20, and we'll begin right around in the beginning of the chapter. Listen to this. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now I know what somebody's thinking. Yeah, but it says whoever is deceived thereby. How about I just not be deceived? That's that first verse. It tells you straight up that wine mocks and it is a, a brawler, it causes brawling and violence. What would you add to that? Well, it doesn't mean that it's that way for me sometimes and not other times, mm. as some people would, would like to think. You know, oh, it's okay if it's in this scenario or that scenario. No, it says it's all those things every single time. So That's you have right. to be very careful. There's another passage in Proverbs 31, verse 4. He says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. And so the Bible says that it's not for kings, number one. Number two, it says that it causes you to forget the law and to pervert justice. And as Christians, obviously, we don't want to forget God's law, nor do we want to pervert justice. Now, what's fascinating is when you go to Revelation chapter 1, the Bible describes uh, something that Jesus does for us. It says in Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus makes us kings and priests before his Father. And in Proverbs, it said alcohol is not for kings. It's not for kings. So as Jesus makes us kings by adopting us into the family of God, certainly that principle would apply to us. Not only that, he says he makes us priests. So we don't want to, uh, you, you wouldn't want your pastor up there preaching a sermon after drinking a couple of beers. You would not. You would not. Here's what it says in Proverbs 23. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has babbling? who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Now, very straight counsel here. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Talking about fermentation. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes shall behold strange women and your heart shall utter perverse things. Talking about the tendency to immorality. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. The room spins, and your, your, your world starts to do this sort of a thing. They have stricken me, you shall say, and I was not sick. They've beaten me, and I didn't feel it. When shall I awake? And then it says this, six words. I will seek it yet again. again. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't poison it. We can say this very matter-of-factly. As two people who used to drink alcohol way, 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 way back in the dark ages of our lives, but you know, there comes a time when light shines in your heart and you want to do the will of God. You say, no, take this away. Take this away. If you're a social drinker, oh, I only drink occasionally, then you won't miss it very much. That's right. And by the way, I would say this. If you know someone who drinks alcohol, try to be kind. Try to be uh, gracious. Don't be condemning. Uh, conviction only comes from the Holy Spirit. As we've spoken about this, our prayer would be that the Spirit of God has spoken somehow to your heart. All right, we're going to be back in just a moment. If you have a question for us, Email it to us, lineuponline at iiw.org, 
line upon line at iiw.org. With West Peppers, I'm John Bradshaw. Back with more in a moment. This is Line Upon Line. This coming October, a brand new season of Sabbath School. We're looking at God's mission, my mission. What role do you have in sharing the good news of Jesus with the world, with your friends, family, neighbors, strangers? And what role do I have? We're going to be joined by the authors of this quarter's Sabbath School lesson with a great wealth of experience in this area. Greg, you're one of the authors of this quarter's Sabbath School lesson. What do we have to look forward to? We have a lot to look forward to because this book is God's mission manual. From Genesis to Revelation, it gives us examples and instruction of how we do mission. And the lesson is written by practitioners who are working with the world religions, working with the secular post-Christian context and in urban areas on how to best share. So you'll have the opportunity not only to study God's word, but to be challenged in how to share your faith with others. Join us for Sabbath School on itiswritten.tv. Welcome back to Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. I'm John Bradshaw with West Peppers. We're answering your Bible questions, and we want to say thank you for getting Bible questions to us. Every question we answer is a question we have received here at It Is Written. And so I'm going to go to the next question. This is from Cindy, who says, Wes, God tells Moses to take vengeance on the Midianites, but Moses' father-in-law was a priest of Midian. So his wife, Moses' wife, was a Midianite, right? That's correct. And, uh, you know, the Midianites were often the enemies of God's people, Mm -hmm. and they often caused them trouble. And the time had come where their cup was full, and God says it's time to remove them. And it's noteworthy to say that God will not destroy a group of people until they reach the point of no return. If there's an opportunity for them to repent, he bears with the evil that they make on the earth, hopefully that they will turn and be saved. And so, uh, yeah, his wife was a Midianite, but that doesn't mean he was going to kill his wife. It was a command to wipe out that society of people. I do want to come back to the point you made. I think it bears us drilling down mm-hmm. on a little more. You see, people who get frustrated with the Bible, sometimes atheists or agnostics or whatever, have a real hard time with this thing of God wiping people out, yes. destroying nations. Okay, well, let's understand something. How many of those people would say, I wish World War II had never happened? Everybody, I would guess. Mm -hmm. What if it hadn't happened? What I'm saying is Hitler would have overrun Europe. Uh, The British would be speaking German today. And who knows what would be happening here in the United States. We might be speaking German as well. So the point is, sometimes warfare is necessary. I say that in a very human way. You understand what I mean? From a human point of view, sometimes it's necessary. So, so we already have some framework for understanding when it's appropriate to go to war. I know that's a tricky one. God didn't do this when it was inappropriate. He had pled and pled and pled with people to turn around. And the Midianites posed an existential threat to Israel. Mm-hmm. It was just better for everybody that they're not there. Yeah. Justice can seem harsh sometimes. It's rough stuff. But God is love, and God is merciful. You know, there's a passage in Genesis that talks about that very thing uh, when Abraham was coming out, if I recall correctly, I think it's Genesis chapter 15. And it's Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, and it's when God is dealing with Abraham, and he's coming out, God's calling him out of the land that he was in, and he says this, But in the fourth generation they shall return here, For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Yeah, how about that? And later God calls them to be destroyed. And so God was bearing with that evil nation, seeking to get them to repent. And finally, when their cup is full, then they they were eliminated. Not because God is cruel, but because God is just. It was to prevent further evil. And they had reached a point where no matter what he did for them, or no matter what calls he gave to them, They would never turn away from that evil. And at that point in time, they're just causing worse corruption upon the earth. Amen. Can evil angels kill each other during the millennium? Can they build weapons of mass destruction during the thousand years they're here on earth alone with Satan and so forth? Can 
evil angels kill each other during the millennium. No, I don't think the Bible says that. No, they're metaphysical beings, and that's right. We don't believe they're out killing each other. Uh, do they? Do they build? We have no record of yeah. angels constructing. Now, what they do is inspire people mm -hmm. to do all kinds of crazy things. But at this time, there are no people on the earth during the millennium. And after the millennium, all the lost of all the ages will be resurrected and there at one time. So there will be a lot of deception and, as you said, inspiration, inspiring them to do something. We don't know exactly what that will look like. But I think it's worthy to note that it's God who brings that judgment. Mm -hmm. God's the one who will bring the destruction. It's not people killing each other or angels. They may be pretty mad at Lucifer by then because he's deceived them all that time. But it's God that will bring that final judgment of destruction. David asks, did God create Satan because God wanted us to have free choice? And then will Satan perish along with those who died in sin without forgiveness? Two questions. So why did God create Satan? Well, really easy answer to that question, and that is that God didn't create Satan. God created a perfect being whose name was Lucifer, Lucifer, a very high-ranking angel. Bible describes him as a covering cherub. He dwelled in the actual presence of God. He became self-centered and selfish, and sin came that way. God didn't create a devil. No, he created a perfect, beautiful angel. Satan really created himself, and he's the one that chose to disobey God. He's the one that allowed that, that uh, thought in his heart to continue to grow until it birthed sin. In a certain sense, we see that in the world. Mm -hmm. Many people who've gone on to be um, infamous criminals, right. their mothers will say, he was such a lovely boy. The high school yeah. classmates will say, well, when we knew her, she was just the sweetest thing. Never imagined she could do such a thing. And uh, though we're humans and not perfect angels, it's a similar principle. Lucifer started perfect, went bad. The reason was he chose to go bad because he was selfish. So God gave us free choice and the uh, misuse of that free choice by Lucifer was what created a devil, Satan. A continual choice to reject. You know, I just had this discussion with my son the other day, and there was a very sensitive issue that uh, he had responded to in a very positive way. That, you know, he was confronted with a thing, and he said, no, I don't want to do that, and he turned away from it. And he talked to me about it, and he was like, I'm so thankful that I, that I had the Holy Spirit speaking mm, to me. Amen. And I said, son, that's the importance of constantly responding immediately to God. If you choose to harden your heart and say, I'm going to do this anyway, it gets harder to hear him the next time. And that's really the story of Lucifer. God kept moving him. He hardened himself into the place where he's just completely rebellious and rejecting God's mm -hmm. voice to him. Mm -hmm. So. Will Satan perish along with those who died in sin without forgiveness? Hey, let me read something to you, my friend. Um, Ezekiel chapter 28. Let me read something to you. This is what many people don't keep in mind, and they absolutely should. This is a great, great verse. Ezekiel chapter 28, and we'll pick it up here. We could start in verse 12 or verse 13, but I'm going to come down here to verse... 18. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your traffic. Therefore I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Yes, Lucifer will perish. He will be brought to ashes. He will be completely, completely destroyed. And then verse 19 says, All they that knew thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, you shall be a terror, and never shall you be any more. There's another verse in there that says, they will look upon you. You know, I believe in that day we're going to look at Lucifer and go, wow, really? We let that cause so much misery in our lives? Maybe we should say today, I don't need to be overtaken by that, because greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. What's our next question? Sure. Next question comes from Nancy, and she asks, I see the Bible speaks about the elect. Does this mean that some cannot be saved? Really interesting, isn't it? Because God did predestine some to be saved. But who did God predestine to be saved? He predestined all of us to be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's decision was all 
should be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That doesn't mean, though, that all will be saved. God has opened the door to everybody, you understand. That's right. And that means that this, this opportunity to be saved is received by everyone. Now, there have been theologians over the years, um, impactful theologians who have well-meaning. stated otherwise. Mm-hmm. Well-meaning. Yeah. And uh, they've said that only, I've heard people say that of all the people living on the earth, only a certain number of those will be saved. And no matter what the rest do, no matter how much they could plead to God and beg him to save them, he just says, nope, you're not part of the chosen. And so what happens, man? That's it, discouraging. If somebody takes a Bible verse and stretches it this way and that way and turns yeah. it around like a pretzel, and they build a theology on that. And, and look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point at Calvin with this predestination and say that's what he had to have done because he ignored all those other Bible verses. That's right. He was a great man of God and did many great things. But this predestination theology, we It's discouraging. I mean, very. Peter says that God is not willing that any should perish, mm-hmm. but that all should come to repentance. If God wants all, then he makes a way for all. And really, it comes down to the elect being those that choose to respond to the invitation of God. That That's is right. for all. And so I always like to say we are chosen because we have chosen. Mm. Those who are elect are because they've elected. They've chosen to follow God and give their hearts to him and respond to the gospel. And that's a beautiful thing. Last question. It's from Fiona. Thanks, Fiona. The question is, is Jesus omnipresent? We've got less than a minute. What's the answer? Well, before Jesus came as a man, he had that same quality as God omnipresent. When he became a man... He yielded up that. He, he gave up certain privileges of his divinity as he walked upon this earth. And the Bible says that Jesus is always going to be human, he, that, he, that God gave him. We didn't borrow Jesus or God didn't lend him to us, but he became a man. He will always be a man. And so when he uh, went back to heaven, he, he yields up that omnipresence. Now, the way that he is omnipresent is through the Holy Spirit. Yes. That's why he told his disciples in John 14, when I go to my Father, I'm not going to leave you an orphan. I'm not going to leave you behind, knowing he'd be there and we'd be here, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives in the heart. Christ lives in the heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's how he's still omnipresent. Wes, outstanding. That's all we have time for. This all time right. flies by. We are so glad you've joined us. Join us again next time. If you have a question, please get it to us. Our email address is lineuponline at iiw.org. We'd love to answer your question. With Wes Peppers, I am John Bradshaw. This has been Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written.